Hey guys, welcome to Aurology Biology. On the bench today, I have received in a Vakman chronograph, which I believe is from the 1940s. It's a 12 hour register with a Venus 178 caliber inside. It's 37 millimeter full stainless steel, and it's actually not Swiss, it is actually French. So for the remainder of the video, I will of course be doing this in the French accent for you guys, which is super fresh and of course, super nice. Of course, I'm joking because there's no way that I could keep that up for the whole video. As usual, I'm going to strip this watch down. I'm going to fully inspect it. I'm going to pre-clean everything, run it through the clean machine, and I'm going to rebuild it for you guys in the video. So of course, let's crack on. So it's not uncommon to see Swiss based watches with France written on the dial or the movement. I have actually seen this many times before, especially with some Hoyer watches with France written on the dial. I'm not entirely sure the reasons behind this. So you guys might be able to educate me in regards to what it actually is. If I had to make an educated guess, I would believe it was similar to what Omega were doing with certain countries where they would case up their watches with different manufacturers. For example, in the UK, you would find Denison cases with Omega watches. And I believe it was to do with taxation because it would be cheaper to import watches as parts rather than a complete watch itself. Maybe this is a similar thing. I'm not entirely sure. So please guys, let me know in the comments if you know what the reason was behind this. So as you can see here, we have got the Venus 178 and it's a nice movement. It's not my favorite chronograph, not at all. And it actually gave me a bit of a challenge. I much prefer the Valju 72 as a 12 hour register within the same era, but here we have got this Venus 178. Now I've removed all of the hands, as you can see, and the watch is removed from the case and I'm basically going to be taking off the dial. Now the dial was held on with the two dial feed screws, as you just saw underneath, a little bit of a different location to the Valju 72, but the principle is exactly the same. So I've removed the dial washer and I've removed the hour wheel. Now I can just take off the cannon pinion and it's a pretty beefy one, as you can see, pretty long. Now, as always with working on vintage watches or watches in general, if you can remove the balance immediately or as soon as possible, uh, it just basically minimizes any kind of damage to it. I've explained this before. The hairspring is so delicate, so it's just nice to take that away and put it safely until you're going to need it later on. And this one's in pretty damn good condition. The next thing that I obviously do with this with working on a chronograph is you want to remove all of the tension from within the chronograph mechanism itself. And there's quite a few springs that you need to remove. By doing this, when you're removing other parts, things are not going to fly because they'll be held under tension. So obviously removing all of the tension from the springs is going to completely eliminate that. So removing the operating lever and it's really similar as well to the Valshu 72, quite a long one, as you can see. More springs underneath and I'm just going to put those away to one side in my parts box. The other thing that I do, you don't see it all the time on the camera, obviously, because this video took quite a long time and it's been edited down. I always put my screws back where they came from. Now, I don't do this with a lot of automatic watches because they're pretty straightforward. But when it's coming to working on a chronograph watch, I highly advise popping the screws back where they came from because they're so small and they look similar, but they're a lot of the times completely different lengths different thicknesses and believe me you will 100% unless you're a mind reader and you've got the memory of like I don't know an elephant or whatever you're going to completely forget which screw goes in which place and that's just going to cause you a massive headache so simply just pop your screws back exactly where they came from they're going to get cleaned anyway then in the cleaning machine as well and you're going to know exactly which screw lives where it's really the best thing to do guys So it's actually been a while since I've done a video. And the reason behind this is I dropped a comment in the community tab. I've been ill and not nice ill. No man, disgusting, coughing, sneezing, slithering, whatever you want to call it. Somebody gave me a cold. I don't know who it was, but I would really, really like their name and address details so I can pay them a visit and have a conversation with them about the disgusting cold that I was given. Two weeks, man, two weeks of it. It's not normal. And I'm talking about one of those like, really heavy coughing kind of illnesses where you're getting woken up in the night with just continuous coughing and coughing. Man, one morning I woke up, it was not normal. 
my actual temples on the side of my head hurt so much just from coughing all the way through the night. So I'm kind of glad that I'm pretty much over that now. So obviously I can get back to uh, making videos because it's been quite a while. So breaking all of the chronograph mechanism down and I've just removed uh, the coupling as well. I'm also removing rest of the chronograph components like the 12 hour register, the 30 minute register. And now, of course, you can see that there's an additional little bridge that lives on top. Now, on the Valjoux 72, the ratchet wheel and the um, crown wheel, they're actually located underneath the main train of wheels bridge. And this ratchet wheel has got a problem, as you just saw. It's actually got teeth missing, and quite a few teeth, which is actually a bit strange as well, because when I was winding this watch, I had no indication that there was any teeth missing. It wound pretty smooth. I think... Because the teeth that are broken are a little bit, you know, like not next to each other, let's say, so much. So it wasn't going to misfire. But of course, I'm definitely going to need to replace that. So I already ordered one. I got one really cheap. I Literally, I was really surprised as well. It only cost me, I think it was about five or six euros. Uh, so I'm really happy about that. And I'm going to put in a new, uh, brand new ratchet wheel into this, into this watch. Because, yeah, that ratchet wheel is completely beyond repair. And again, it's one of those situations where I think broken parts have been put back into this watch because I found no indication of broken teeth anywhere within the movement itself. So a little bit strange. So I hope you guys are doing okay as well. Hope you've had a better uh, two weeks than I have. I know my voice sounds still a little bit hoarse. Uh, I still feel it a little bit, but uh, definitely... Uh, over the main bulk of it, let's say. And I hope your week has been uh, doing really good. And of course, we're moving up to the festive period. Mmm, Christmas time. Where everybody eats too much, and drinks too much, and does stupid stuff. But I hope you're all, of course, going to have a really nice break. Uh, spend time with your families, time off work, things like that. So just removing the escape wheel. I've removed all of the power to the watch, as you can see, obviously, while I've been waffling on. And now I can tackle the uh, pallet forks. Just removing the pallet cork. And they were a little bit sticky. The watch is a little bit dry, but I'm happy to see that, as you guys can see as well, there's literally no rust. There's just a lot of dried oil. Uh, probably not been serviced for a very long time. But so far, things are not looking too bad. Apart from, of course, that very strange uh, ratchet wheel with the broken teeth. So, of course, the barrel. And another thing that you can point out there, as you can see underneath, uh, quite a strange barrel lid that it actually has the marks on there for how the 12-hour register will operate. So that operates directly from the mainspring barrel. Again, similar to the Valjoux 72. The difference here is, is that it actually has the, yeah, what shall I say, the teeth or the notches indented into the barrel lid, as you could see. And uh, I was quite surprised to see that because, um, yeah, I was surprised that it wouldn't actually have been an additional part, let's say, rather than actually having it onto the barrel lid itself. So just breaking down the underside of the watch now. And as you can see, I've got a broken screw here. And I had a big look in regards to finding another screw that would fit this. And unfortunately, I didn't have, didn't have anything in my parts box. So I'm going to have to reuse it. From a functionality point of view, it still does work. But of course, I'm not over the moon about it being broken. Um, but functionally, it does obviously work. Removing the bridge that is holding down all of the levers underneath for the 12 hour. And I'm just being careful not to crack anything or misalign anything. Off goes the runner for the 12 hour. And I'm just making sure that I put everything in my boxes. Uh, sorry, in my part box. Another thing as well I would say guys as a tip 
uh, really organize your parts in your parts tray accordingly. Like I group things in separate parts. So if I'm working on an automatic watch, I will have all of the automatic works in one section. Uh, I'll have the train of wheels in another section and so forth, keeping my screws in the same places as well. And another thing as well, which I always advise, and I don't do this with every watch. This watch is something I did do it with. Before I pop everything into the cleaning machine, I take a photograph of the parts tray as well, because I want everything to go back exactly where it was. And if it's a movement that you're not super familiar with, and the Venus 178 is not something that I'm super familiar, familiar with, it's not. Uh, it's really good that you have things like this as a reference point. So breaking down the keyless works, uh, off goes the yoke, the yoke spring. And then I can remove the setting lever sp screw and the setting lever spring, the winding pinion, the sliding pinion. So pre-cleaning all of the parts by pegging the jewels, making sure you get all of that dirty oil out is really important. So guys, special thank you to all of the HB members of the channel and the patrons, of course. All of your names are up on the screen. I really appreciate you guys. Cannot say it more than I already do. Thank you so much for supporting the channel. Channel's been growing hard. Over 14,000 subscribers now. Mmm, super fresh. Really, really like that. Mad curious if I'm going to hit 15 before the end of the year, which would be a massive accomplishment. So thank you so much. So I just removed the mainspring from the barrel and I'm also giving that a good clean as well. I am actually going to stick a new mainspring in this, even though I do clean the old one. I always think for a watch, if you do have some mainsprings at hand, it is advisable to replace them when you service a watch. Putting all the parts in the parts tray ready for the cleaning machine and then I can pop it in. And I've talked about this before. I really do like this automatic cleaning machine that I have. It's a beast. And it does a really, really good job. So now we can get on with the rebuild of the watch. I am adding a little bit of 1300 to the inside of the barrel. And then I can pop in this nice juicy mainspring that I've got for the Venus 178. By coincidence, I didn't actually know this when I saw it, but the uh, mainspring for the Venus 178 or the 188 it's exactly the same mainspring that you would use on a Valju 7733 or 7, 7734, sorry. Um, and that's a really, really common movement. So obviously the mainsprings are really affordable and in mass production. So, I mean, well, they were in mass production and they're still very, very easy to get hold of. So definitely advisable to stick a new mainspring in after a service. And of course, now we can go to oiling up the capstones and the inker blocks. So just removing it with a piece of Rodico and then I separate the two pieces. I do give the bottom part a quick dip in one dip just to give it an extra clean now that it's been separated. And then I rub off any dried oil from the top capstone Pop it into some fixer drop. And once I've removed these, I let these dry for a split second. And then, of course, I can oil it with some 9010. Small drop in the middle is more than enough. And then just, of course, add the two pieces together. Now, you do want to repeat the process for this on both sides. Uh, I'm just guys showing you guys the uh, top one, but the process for the underside or the dial side, so to speak, is exactly the same. So I always do that in that fashion. First, I will deal with the mainspring with the barrel, and then I will deal with oiling the capstones. And of course, once you've done that, you want to then remove your complete balance and this time put it somewhere super safe, keep it dust covered, put it away because you're going to use this later on. So a little 1300 for where the setting lever screw is going to go. 
and then I can tighten that up with the setting lever underneath. I'm also going to build up the keyless works straight away on this movement. So adding in the sliding pinion and the winding pinion, and then I can pop in the crown with the winding stem. So on goes the minute wheel and the intermediate wheels. Little 1300 on the posts. Then I can add in the yoke and the yoke spring. And it's a really small looking um, uh, yoke on this one. Very strange looking little yoke. When you're adding springs as well, just try and hold something down with a piece of plastic or some pegwood. Uh, it stops your springs from flying around. And of course, on goes that big uh, setting lever spring. Held in with the two screws. And I've also greased uh, the end of it as well, which is important to add lubrication on parts like this because they're high friction parts. So once I've done that, I'm going to turn the movement over, I'm going to start building up the rest of the watch. Now, when I work on a chronograph, I do it in two parts. I will build up the timing mechanics of the watch one day so that it's running basically like a normal watch. And then I will usually go back to it the day after or maybe a day after that. It depends on time. And then I will build up the chronograph side of it. And this is something that I was always told to do uh, for two reasons. One, it gives you a good understanding if the timing mechanics are running okay. And if you need to address anything that's really serious, let's say, that you're going to see. And the other side of it is, of course, is, you know, they're more complicated movements. So it's a lot to undertake in one go. So it also gives you a break by doing it um, over a two day period or it doesn't matter how long, you know, or, you know, you could take a week. It doesn't matter. Like, take your time. But just I was always told just doing it all in one go. It's it's a lot, basically. So as you can see, on has gone the trainer wheels bridge, and now I'm going to be fitting in the uh, spring for the click, the click spring. And then the click goes on with just that one screw. And as I told you guys earlier on, I got a brand new ratchet wheel for a really, really affordable price. I was very happy about that. And of course, it definitely needed to be replaced with all of those screws missing. It's not normal. No, sir. It was not. On goes the crown wheel. Added a little bit of grease underneath. And I'm adding a little bit of 1300 just on the inside for where the crown wheel core is going to go. And then that's held in with the two screws. Not reverse threaded screws, guys, because there's two. These, these ones just screw on in the, uh, the normal fashion. Now, a little bit of grease for where the cannon pinion is going to go. And then I'm sliding it on. And as you can see here, I'm aligning my minute wheel teeth before I fully push this down. Now, guys, I cannot stress this enough. Really pay attention to that. If you just bang your cannon pinion on, they can be very stiff to fit. And if you're forcing it down with a pair of tweezers, which is normal, you would do that, and it suddenly just bangs and clicks into place, there is a high probability that you could break off some of your teeth from your minute wheel. That's not fresh. No, sir, it's not. That would be a big problem for you. So by doing it like that, you can do it one of two ways. Either don't have your minute wheel on to start with. That's probably the better way, but I'm obviously used to it now. So the other option is, is that when you are pushing it down, make sure that your minute wheel teeth are aligned with the cannon pinion teeth, and therefore you're not going to hit anything when you drop it down. So moving on to the pallet forks. Oh yeah, and another thing I wanted to say as well, yeah, 
I have noticed on this video, and I give you my sincere apologies. I can see that on some of the shots there is a cursor on the screen, and once you've seen it, it cannot be unseen. No sir, it cannot, and I can see it. It's to do with the microscope camera. Um, you control the settings with it with a mouse, which is a little bit tedious, but you know when you're editing the videos, it's not a big problem. But what's happened is I'm, I will focus it with the mouse and then I will move the mouse out of the way and the cursor. But if I accidentally knock it while I'm working with my elbow or something, then it comes into the shot. And I'm obviously not noticing this until later on when I recheck uh, the camera angles. So my apologies regarding that, but um, try not to focus on it too much. So on goes the balance complete and that is looking damn good. I mean, we've got a really nice swing on that. Really, really happy to see it the way it's looking. So it's a new day and we're going to build up the chronograph. Starting on the 12 hour register side. And this is the part that I was talking about. It's similar to the Valju 72, but not the part which is aligned directly onto the barrel lid. And again, I'm quite surprised that it's like that because the barrel lids are quite thin and if they warped, let's say a little bit, then yeah, that would be a big problem. So I'm curious guys, what are your plans for the end of the year? Is it going to be a big New Year's Eve bash or are you just having a quiet time? I'm curious what you guys will be doing. Let me know in the comments. And of course, I wish you all the best. Don't get me wrong. Don't get too loose though. No sir, you will regret it. You will wake up with the hangover of doom and you'll be thinking to yourself, man, I'm too old for this. I should not have done this. I don't even know who this person is lying next to me. What have I done? How am I going to tell people about this? <laughs> okay, maybe it's not, not as bad as that. But um, yeah, just try to take it easy, guys. I actually have another couple of watches at the moment as well. So probably this is not going to be the last video from me before the end of the year. Uh, I think I'll do a live stream. I have a really nice Grand Seiko. Um, and I think that I will do a, a live strip down of that. Uh, it'd be nice to talk to you guys before the end of the year. So yeah, look out for that. I'll set a date for that in the next uh, few days. And um, yeah, I think that will be cool to do before the end of the year. So just adding in spring. And as you can see, I am using a piece of uh, plastic. Uh, just to hold it in place because, man, this one was evading me a lot. It was quite a difficult spring to fit this one. I have edited the video because it sprung away from me a few times. It just would not align, man. It was uh, really giving me a challenge. So also in the world of uh, watch tools, one thing that I have picked up in the last uh, few weeks, uh, you will see it also later on in the video, I've been after one for quite some time, but they are ridiculously expensive for what they are. And I did say to myself that when the Chinese one that I have uh, dies a death, I would replace it. Uh, and I'm talking about my standard crystal press. I have a rubber press as well, which I use. Uh, a vintage one which is very good but obviously it's not suitable for all kinds of crystals and to be honest I use the Chinese one uh, more commonly for the type of stuff that I will uh, work on so i had been looking at some of the crystal presses uh, from Bergeon and I, I, I wanted one I think it's the 5550 reference number don't quote me on that but they are insanely expensive. I think they're around 600, 700 euros for a set. Anyway, by mad coincidence, I found one on a local second-hand website in the Netherlands 
and the guy was asking half the price of new and this thing is virtually in new condition so i had to snap it up you know i did so i'm happy to say that i did and i'm really really happy with it i've used it a couple of times already i also used it in this video as well so you're going to see it later on towards the end when i refit the crystal it's really smooth everything just clicks into place so better and it's yeah it's so precise so I'm obviously happy that I didn't pay like around 700 bucks for it and I got it for half that price because I do think it is ridiculously overpriced for what it is at the end of the day. Um, but I'm very, very happy that I've got one finally. And of course, I, uh, I definitely uh, recommend it. Really, really good. Really, really good quality. So continuing building up the chronograph, I'm just making sure that this spring is engaging on one side first and then it will engage on the other side when I build up the rest of the chronograph. And again, like I said, guys, by having your screws put back onto the movement, you just know exactly where everything is supposed to live in regards to the screws. You're going to have your right screws in the right places, no messing around. It is the most logical way of doing it. So just aligning the spring. Very, very delicate spring, this one. I had to take very, very uh, special care with it because it's so thin. So adding on the hammer. And some of these parts as well, they're so fiddly. Um, I'm not going to say I'm not going to say that I hated uh, working on this movement, not at all. I definitely found it more challenging, but it's because I'm not as familiar with it as I am with other chronographs, let's say. So therefore, it felt like to me that it took me longer uh, than usual. But of course, I suppose that's like anything, you know. If you're not used to something, like then it's of course it's going to take uh, longer. I mean. Valju 72, for example, like, I feel like I could do that with my eyes closed now. It's, it feels so natural uh, to work on. And we're really getting close to the end of this as well. And I'm really, really happy with how it's going and how it's looking. So just making sure that I'm adding a little bit of grease to all of the appropriate springs. And then I can just pop those in place and, of course, make sure that they're set. Usually what I do as well with the springs is I will just tighten them around halfway, align the spring and then screw the rest of the screw down. So just testing the chronograph and I can see that it fires up. So I'm happy about that. We've got it nicely engaged. And of course, the not much more for me to do. So I'm just doing some oiling. I'll be adding 9010 to the jewels. Uh, for the center wheel, I always add 1300. But what you're seeing right about now on the screen is 9010. It's one of the finest oils and it's definitely the right oil to use. I'm also adding a little bit of 1300 on for where the cannon pinion is, uh, on top of the cannon pinion, sorry, so that I can put the hour wheel on. And of course I can fit the dial back onto the watch. Now, of course, I want to make sure that I've aligned everything correctly. And the best way to do this is just to look straight down like a bird's eye view into it. And as you can see, it's held in tight with these two dial feed screws on the back of the movement. Again, really similar to the Valju 72, just in a completely different location. And these hands as well were really, really nice. Now, another strange thing about this watch, which I forgot to mention earlier on concerning the loom. 
I'm thinking that this is, it must have been relumed at some point. And the reason being is, I do believe that this is a 1940s watch. Again, correct me if I'm wrong. I could be wrong. Uh, but I was not finding, the hands are not radium is what I was trying to say. I got no radioactive measurements from the Geiger counter coming off of this whatsoever. So either they've been redone or it's old tritium. I'm not 100% sure. So when you're putting your hands on as well, just make sure that everything is set exactly where it's supposed to go. So 12 for 12, etc. And keep checking as well that your hour hand is not going to touch any of the subdial hands. That's really important because any kind of touch and things will basically stop the whole watch from moving. Now, another thing and another tip what I do here is the chronograph, get in this bang on 12. Now, here's what I do. You'll see I use my tweezers to kind of position the tip of it. You see how I did it in place before I push it down? Because when you push it down, it will move a little bit left or a little bit right. It's completely normal. You'll never get it bang on. But by using your tweezers to hold the tip, it just gives you a better chance of getting it as close to 12 as possible. So a quick check of the reset. And I'm pretty happy with that. So here we go. The Bergeon tool crystal refitting that I was talking about. It's really, really nice, really like it. I think they're made out of aluminium. Um, and you've got all the different size dies, which I really like. So everything I, I've got everything I need basically now, which is really good. And it takes very little pressure because the way that it's weighted uh, to fit a crystal, a lot easier than the Chinese one. But the Chinese one that I had, it wasn't broken. It is now obviously, but it wasn't broken. So I was like, well, why do I need to replace it? So casing up the watch, I've offered the movement to the case and then I can pop in the movement holder and of course I can tighten it up with the two screws. Of course, before that I've greased up the winding stem and then I'm just putting that into the watch and tightening it up with the one screw. Movement is held in with these two movement holder screws, one on each side and they just nip in place and tighten it up to the wall of the movement holder. Also, of course, like on any watch, I'm fitting a brand new gasket. It's important that you grease it up. So first I'm just measuring it to see what size I need, and then I will add some silicone grease. It makes it more supple, it makes it easier to apply, and of course it adds to it being a little bit more waterproof, even though this is not a waterproof watch still important that you have a gasket in the back of your case back. So check it on the timographer pre-regulation and the amplitude was off the chain. In fact, in my opinion, the amplitude was a little bit too high. So I have to keep an eye on this because I was not expecting amplitudes up into the 330s. So there we have it guys, the Wachmann chronograph with the Venus 178 inside. I've also included some wrist shots for you guys as well because I was getting some mad complaints that I don't show enough strap shots with the watches that I finished. So there you go. Guys, if you enjoyed this video, there is another video on the screen right now. So grab your coffee, click on it, and you can watch that one too. Guys, as always, till next time.